All right, we will go ahead and get started. There might be a few more that trickle in after y'all's classes. I know some of y'all just got out, um, but hopefully they won't miss too much. But yeah, we can go ahead and get started. So my name is Taryn Woody, and I am a empath student in the DC program. So if you hear any sirens, it's the city, I can't help it. Um, but I am also the editor in chief of the Baines Report. And for y'all that don't know, the Baines Report is the LBJ's student-run publication. And we seek to promote student voices on various policy topics, domestic and foreign, and we accept all types of submissions from LBJ students. So if you're ever interested in submitting a piece for publication, work with us and we can help y'all get that, get that going. Uh, today, we will hear from two experts on editorial writing and learn how to draft an op-ed. And this event is happening in conjuncture with UT Free Speech Week, which is a yearly promotion that includes a series of events designed to increase awareness of and celebrate free speech and free press. So speaking of press, I will introduce our speakers. First is Juan Castillo. He is an editorial page editor at the Austin American Statesman, where he leads the editorial and opinion team and is a member of the newspaper's editorial board. His award-winning career in journalism spans four decades as a reporter, editor, content writer, and radio news director for national and Texas media outlets. As the national editor of the American Statesman, he directed the newspaper's coverage of historic 2000 presidential election, the 2001 terrorist attacks, and the US invasion of Iraq. As a reporter, he has written extensively on diversity, immigration, and race and politics. In 2003, at the Statesman, he created a specialty beat focusing on the intersection of those topics. Castillo is a former John S. Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford University and is the recipient of national and state awards for journalism, including the 2013 prize for feature writing from the National Society for Features Journalism. He's also a native Rio Grande Valley resident from South Texas and still considers himself a citizen of the border. So if there's any other Rio Grande Valley students in here, He's your man. Uh, Matt Penney is a media relations manager at the University of Texas at Austin, where he works to bring positive media coverage to the university through various communication tools. In 2014, he started Texas Perspectives, a wire style service that is intended to provide media outlets with UT facility faculty written opinion columns on a variety of topics and current events. To date, he has placed hundreds of topical op-eds in publications big and small, including in such industry giants like the New York Times, USA Today, and the Washington Post. Prior to coming to UT, Matt was the public information officer for the city of San Antonio, the assistant director of communication at Baylor University, and a communication professional at Boise State University. Before that, he bounced around the country as a television news anchor and reporter working at several affiliated TV stations. And with that, I'd like to hand over the floor to our speakers for the first question. Just to get the basics out of the way, let's get started with what is an op-ed? Juan, can you take us out with that one? Sure, um, I'll try to deal with the outside noise of the, all the yard people in the neighborhood all the weed uh, blowers and all that. Um, Op-ed, I guess, uh, stems from the uh, original meaning, which uh, started oh, more than 100 years ago, I guess, the early, earliest days of newspapers. Uh, and it referred to an opinion piece that was placed opposite the editorial page, uh, hence the name Op-ed. Uh, and, and basically, that's what it is. Uh, its meaning is kind of wide open. And yet, on the other hand, it is as simple as an op-ed is an opinion piece. Um, you know, it, it has relevance, uh, it's timely, it deals with something that is on people's minds and in the news. Um, and it is someone's opinion, usually backed by uh, some expertise of some form. It doesn't have to be uh, expertise um, is, you know, by somebody's uh, um, work experience or uh, studies. Sometimes it can be just uh, expertise in the form of uh, life experience.
Oh, you're muted. Keyword, yeah, keyword <laughs> usually backed by expertise or facts. <laughs> uh, Matthew, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah, and hey everyone, hope everyone's doing well. If you hear a monkey behind me, that'd be my two-year-old, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, I mean, one, one hit it right on the head, you know, it, opinion, you know, it, it can, op it could be any opinion. Um, but it needs to provide specific steps on how to proceed forward. So you'll probably hear me and Juan talk a lot and we'll be repeating a lot of these same things, but that's important is that it has to be moving forward. It's not how we got here, it's how we're gonna move forward. Um, and they need to be specific. You know, you need to have specific steps on how to move forward and a call to action. You need to tell certain groups of people on what they should do. So what should school administrators do? What should lawmakers do? What should the public do? What should Governor Abbott do? Um, and why should he do that? And then you have to back it up with your opinion for it. Um, it's also, I think, important to talk about what an op-ed is not. Um, it is not self-promotional and it is not UT-centric or whatever organization that you represent. It, it's, um, let me give you an example of that, is that a couple of days ago, I had a professor uh, email me what he thought was an op-ed um, about a new collaboration that he founded with a couple other people here at UT and then uh, some industry people out in Houston. And he wrote an op-ed about how great this collaboration is, how it's gonna solve the problems. That's not an op-ed, that's a self-promotional piece. Um, you know, if Juan accepted those type of pieces, then every nonprofit would write an op-ed about how, you know, here's the problem, here's how my nonprofit can solve it. So that's, that's not an op-ed. Um, an op-ed doesn't analyze, it doesn't describe a situation and it is not overly broad. It has to be very specific, and again, it has to be forward-looking. And it can't be too technical, and it can't be jargony. It needs to be something that people, all people who have no idea what you're talking about can understand. Thank you. That is very, very helpful. Um, just two quick reminders, y'all. If you want to put your view on speaker mode, that's helpful for us. And then also, if you have any responses to what Matt or Juan said or any questions, you can throw them in the chat, and we will get to those at the end. But now that we know what an op-ed is, can you both talk a little bit about why it's important? Um, what is the value in thought leadership and written opinion in public discourse? Um, I think, you know, the, the, uh, the opinion section in general and op-eds specifically are another extension of, of the, the free press as a hallmark of uh, democracy. Uh, the opinion pages are sort of the modern day version of the, uh, the town square where people uh, in, in the early days of this uh, country would go to air their grievances or express their opinions on any uh, given topic of the day. This is the modern day version of that. Um, it's the only place in the newspaper where opinion is allowed. Um, we, uh, I hear from readers uh, quite often who complain that they want the opinion pages to just give the facts. They don't like it when we delve into opinion. And, you know, I have to tell folks, this is what our little section is all about. It's all about opinion. Uh, this is the one place where, um, the writers can delve into opinion. Um, people don't quite get that, uh, unfortunately, all the time. But that, that's the main purpose. And it's, I, I believe it has tremendous value in allowing people to express their opinion, uh, backed by you know, some uh, expertise and um, a credible argument. Um, like Matt was saying, a call to action looking forward, um, and, and that has tremendous value because I think people feel like it's, it's a good outlet to not only um, see their opinions reinforced, um, but to see how others are thinking on, a, on a, any given matter. Yeah, you know, the great thing about an opinion is that you can be wrong, you know, so it's, it's your opinion, right? Um, but the value of thought leadership, it, it's just tremendous. And, and from the university's perspective, um, you know, we put a very high, high value on thought leadership. Um, and we do that for a few reasons. We really want our faculty to write um, 
opinion pieces for, for a variety of reasons. Number one is that it ensures accuracy. Um, you know, it helps ensure accurate information of an issue that the faculty member or what you're writing, what you care about. And it helps prevent misinformation um, from spreading around. Um, so for instance, uh, when the family separations were going down at the border, um, one of our social work professors wrote an op-ed about don't blame family separations on the nonprofits that are helping because there was a lot of the nonprofits were getting blamed for the family separations. So that was misinformation, it was inaccurate information. So we wrote an op-ed to clear that up. Um, it, in terms of thought leadership, you know, for selfish reasons for the professor, you know, it positions them as a thought leader and you know, you can, you, you know, the, you go to them for, you know, that particular topic. So, you know, if you think of the names that you might know around UT, you know, uh, Michael Granoff in business or Kevin Coakley or Rich Reddick or Darren Roberts, those guys got those names out there partly through op-eds. You know, they were always part of the public discussion. So, you know, it, it helps raise your stature, if you will. Um, and then an, two other reasons why it's very important is that one is this public service. You know, we want to showcase UT um, as a public university that shares, you know, its knowledge and it's uh, with the citizens, you know, who help support it. Um, and what I like to think is uh, Marsha McNutt's view. She's the, um, the president of the National Academy of Sciences. And she said this great quote that if you want to see greater funding, she's talking to scientists. And she said, if you want to see greater funding for science, then you have to show up when the public needs science information. So, you know, there's a lot of threats right now to higher ed, right? You know, trust, funding, stuff like that. So when we go out and we ask the public for something like funding, we needed to be there when the public needed us to clear up misinformation or to give our thought leadership. And y'all both kind of touched on something about um, a negative response sometimes to opinion writing. Would you say that this negative response is something that's growing or is new? It seems that the way that people are responding to our media is um, changing, especially within the last four years. Yeah, I think in general, you, you do hear more criticism of this idea that uh, newspapers and media should leave opinion out of their reporting. And, and of course we do, uh, not our section, but the, the news section does. Uh, their objective in their news gathering and in their writing and their reporting. Um, I think, you know, if I may, I think this stems a, a bit from, you know, the president's uh, labeling, uh, you know, the, this idea that it's fake news and um, it's not, I mean, it's as simple as that, it's not fake news. Um, if it's a credible news source like the Austin American States Northern or the New York Times, uh, great, great care is taken to ensure that what you see in the paper is factual and uh, objective. Um, the problem with that is, like I was saying earlier, I think people for some reason think that that should extend to the opinion pages, but uh, we are the one forum where um, there should be opinion. And um, I, I think then you start getting into criticism that, well, there should be only the opinion that, that backs my side, but, uh, and whatever side that might be, you know, if you're progressive or conservative, but, but the idea, of the real goal of an opinion section should be to present diverse opinions so that you see what others are thinking, you know, not just what you might be thinking, so that there is not an echo chamber there like you would find on social media. Yes, thank you for that. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I just, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, a little slide a little later, you know, that we do tell our professors that, and, and you should know that, this, you know, as, as you write off as, is to be aware of the reaction. Um, you know, there are certain topics that get people a whole lot more frizzled than other topics. So, um, you know, you know, healthcare, abortion, gun rights, all sorts of that stuff. Uh, that gets people, you know, people have very strong beliefs. So when they, those beliefs get challenged, you know, that, that gets people upset. Um, you know, in one specific case that came to mind, we had a 
an op-ed run about how Texans cannot handle their guns after a recent school shooting a couple years ago. Uh, that professor ended up almost getting death threats. It didn't almost rise that level, but there was some really mean stuff being said to them. You know, his house got egg, um, you know, stuff like that. So, um, you know, be aware of their reaction. Yes, that, that is great uh, advice. And while we're talking that, could you speak a little bit about the, um, you know, what it looks like for Texas perspective? I know you just commented on that for, for one specific uh, editorial, but what else do you see in your day-to-day -day job at Texas perspective? What are you publishing? What are you having to help writers with? Yeah, so well, that's a big question. I could spend 20 minutes talking about <laughs> each one of those things. So to back it up, yeah, Texas Perspectives is just this fancy name that we gave our op-ed wire service. So, um, you know, we send out faculty written op-eds. The authors are strictly faculty. Um, and we send out, you know, anywhere from three to five op-eds per week on a good week and maybe three to five every two weeks, you know, on maybe on a slower, slower time period. Um, we send them uh, non-exclusively, something I'll, I'll talk, can talk about later, um, and they're free, um, so anyone can use them, um, and we've gotten some pretty good feedback um, from them, and, you know, newspapers around Texas, we, we usually make them Texas-centric, so, um, you know, that doesn't really lend itself well to, say, like a newspaper in Oklahoma running it, even though we do send them to newspapers in Oklahoma, um, so, but they are, you know, Texas centric. So, but you know, and they're mainly around Texas. Now that doesn't go to say that we don't go pitch the New York times op-eds or the Washington post or USA today, but really, you know, it's super, super hard to get an op-ed in those, in those pages. You know, I've been doing this for years and you just, it's just almost impossible at the time. Um, so, you know, it's much easier, if you will, to get it into your, into the state newspapers. And then, you know, if you get them in a few different places, then, Hey, you know, you just covered the entire state. If you get in regionally, hey, you can cover Oklahoma, Louisiana, you know, Florida, which is all new states where we send our stuff. We send it to about 40 different publications around the, around the uh, nation. So, you know, and, um, you know, we, they are in a format, you know, that I, I'll talk about a little later, you know, where it's, you know, 650 words, they have to have a call to action. Uh, we don't really shy away from any topics. Um, you know, there are topics that lend themselves better to op-eds. Um, but really, any topic can be an op-ed, but we look for stuff that's trending in the mainstream news. That's what op-ed editors, that is their golden child. They want stuff that's being written about in the news. The opinion section is not an agenda setter. So it follows the news. So it's whatever is trending right now. So, or what's going to be coming up. Remember, forward-looking. So right now, pages are writing, you know, you're going to see stuff about the debate that's coming up. You'll see stuff immediately following the debate you know, or how, what Trump did, what Biden did, stuff like that. So, you know, mainstream news, um, social issues, um, always a good topic, like immigration or what to do with immigrants, uh, policies and politics. Uh, once the ledge starts up here in Texas uh, next, and that's going to be a perfect time. There could be 20 op-eds written about the different, different stuff that's going on. Um, and then, you know, a new idea, anytime that's, there's like a new idea that you can put forward, that would make a good op-ed. So that's what we really look for. We don't, we you know, these are not long, you know, these are not 2000 words. They're, they, you know, they're 700 words, um, and they need to be forward. Like, so and that's what I'm short sentences too. short sentences, short paragraphs. Yes. Thank you. I know we'll talk about that a little <laughs> bit more and, um, get some slides and some instructions for everyone that's interested in participating in our contest that's coming up. But um, Juan, would you say that you are looking for similar things that Texas Perspectives is looking for? I know it's a little bit different, um, but would you say it's the same and what would might be different? Pretty much the same. Uh, yeah. Timeliness, relevance, those are the two big keys. Uh, topics of the day, um, you know, the pandemic. Uh, the upcoming legislative session, um, vaccines, you know, might be another topic. People are talking a lot about that with, with the expectation that there will be a vaccine maybe sometime in the next few months for uh, the coronavirus. Um, you know, relevance is important because that's what people are, are, uh, are thinking about. And, um, one point that we try to, that we have to tell a lot of people who submit op-eds is they'll submit an op-ed on a particular topic that 
is timely and relevant, but we just ran one on that very topic the other day. Um, and that's important if you're uh, going to write an op-ed uh, or if you're in the habit of writing them fairly regularly, and we do have people who do that, is to know your, know your audience and know the outlet you're submitting to. Um, know that they just printed uh, an op-ed on this very topic uh, just the other day or maybe late last week. Uh, and therefore, your chances of getting that one in the paper are going to be small. Um, I will say this, that on a good week, we might get 50 or more op-ed submissions. Um, and we have room to print maybe uh, five a week, five or six. Um, so it's hard to get an op-ed printed. Uh, I think people think that it's easy. Uh, and I think uh, some of that stems from misconceptions, and you're probably getting into this later, but it kind of goes back to what Matt was talking about earlier about what an op-ed is not. I think there are misconceptions that an op-ed is just uh, your opinion and your chance to rant uh, for, you know, 800 words or 1,000 words, and, uh, and it, it is most definitely not, and your chances of getting that in any paper are uh, slim to none. Thank you. That's, That's why it's vitally important, I can't say it again, is that you provide specific action steps for certain groups of people on how to move forward. That, I can't stress that enough. Don't, don't describe and don't analyze. Don't tell me how we got here. I wanna know where we're going. Matt, if you'd like, we can go ahead and jump into uh, the slides. I know you came prepared showing us yeah. how to actually write an op-ed. Sure, well, let me share my screen here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about first the business of op-eds. Um, hold on here. Let's see. All right, so everyone can see, right? All right, good, all right. So the business of op-eds, um, there's two types. There's, well, there's non-exclusive and exclusive. So exclusive means that the publication that accept it is the only one that is going to run your op-ed. Um, you can't give it to anyone else. Um, most publications are exclusive, like all the nationals, they're all exclusive. All of them uh, everywhere prefer exclusivity. The Statesman, Dallas Morning News, they would love it exclusive. Um, but sometimes you can talk to the editor and they don't necessarily require it. Um, so, you know, that would mean that it could run. Now, you know, we don't, what we do is we don't run it, say, in the Austin American Statesman, and then I go to the Austin Chronicle and, and sell it. But I don't, I don't do that in the same market. But, you know, if there's something in where it's, um, um, you know, where you can sell them to different markets around like San Antonio, um, you know, the different markets, then, you know, that would be a non-exclusive model. Big publications do not accept as is your op-ed will most likely be edited and changed. It's a little less likely that the Statesman or the Dallas Morning News will, will do a major edit, um, unless you know, they see something that's glaring and they wanna take the time. I mean, Juan and the, the editors are so busy that they just simply don't have time to do it. Um, the national editors, uh, they're really looking for something specific. So uh, you know, I keep telling faculty, don't, don't expect that what you send them is what they're going to print. There will be changes. Also, do not worry about the title or your byline. Um, the title, the publications reserve the right and a lot of times do change your title. Um, so if you think you have the best title, that's great, send it, but just be aware that they could change it. Uh, bylines, this more has to go with professors. I don't know how many times, you, I'm sure you get emails from your professors that are bylines like six, six lines long, right? He's the centennial professor of that, he's this, he's that, 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 that. Just keep the byline short. You are, you know, an assistant professor of public policy at the LBJ School at the University of Texas. That's all that really matters. And then finally, something that we were already kind of talked about, be aware of the reaction. Um, you know, opinions get people going. So, you know, be aware of that. Uh, something I tell all my faculty is that do not, it's up to them if they want to respond to someone who read the op-ed and then, you know, wrote a nasty gram or wants to write. It's up to the professor if they want to respond back. But my, my feeling is don't respond back, let the op-ed 
stand for itself because you don't want to get into a match going back and forth with somebody that you have no idea who they really are. There's two different type types, if you will, of op-eds. There's a proactive op-ed. So that means that this is a topical issue that's coming up. So something that you want to write about. So this is like something that you can plan for, right? So this is um, like the upcoming debate. You know, like last week we were writing op-eds about this week's debate. Um, Veterans Day, you know, the upcoming election, something like that, something that you can plan. And if you time it to something like this, you need to give the op-ed editor um, probably a week um, to, to place it. So if, you know, you have Veterans Day is what, the second week, the second week of November, we would probably start placing that, try to place some like maybe the first week, you know, of November. You can't send them um, an op-ed one day and expect it to run the next day. That's just simply not going to happen. It can happen and does happen, but it probably won't happen. Where it does happen is this next one with a reactive op-ed. This is that something's happened and you want to respond. So time is crucial, like 24 hour time frame. And this is what editors want. And this is where you could get your op-ed in like a national publication or, you know, or it go bonkers everywhere is that there's been a school shooting. So you want to talk about gun control. There was a school shooting. You want to talk about teacher burnout. Um, you know, it's linking your expertise to something that just happened because the most important thing is the topical reference, something that just happened because that's what editors want. Again, they want something in the news. All right. Okay. So there's basic op-ed writing tips. Have a topical reference. Timing is essential, right? So when an issue is dominating the news, whether it's war or whatever, uh, what readers want to read and op editors want to publish is what's happening in the news. So keep on top of the news and then put your topical reference in there right up front. You need to offer specific recommendations and call to action. So an op-ed is not a news story. It is not, it doesn't describe a situation. It's your opinion on how to improve matters. So you need to offer those specific recommendations and you need to do it more. You need to take it more of a step than, than calling for more funding and more research. Can't tell you how many faculty I get saying that. That's great. You know, why? You know, what type of it? Take it the next step. Get more specific. Try to make a single point and then put it on top. You, you know, you only have a certain amount of space to do this. So you can't cover too many things. Um, and that usually ups the length too of an op-ed. So, you know, you want to keep it very, very narrow and then put your main point up on top. Again, it's where we, where do we go from here? Not how we got here. Do not describe, do not analyze, just keep it forward looking. You use active voice and short sentences and paragraphs. Avoid tedious rebuttals. So let's say you read something that just made your blood boil and you want to write a point by point rebuttal of that. That's not an op-ed. That's a letter to the editor. And that should be 250 words. Um, an op-ed, again, is your own specific idea. So if you do want to rebuttal something, simply just mention it in the, in the beginning part, maybe a sentence. And most of the time, the people, your readers haven't even read that or don't even know what you're talking about to begin with. And then go into why that person was wrong and promote your own idea. And then make your ending a winner. The, the, the front, the, the, the first three paragraphs are really the most important. It's the you know, topical reference, it's your opinion and your call to action. But equally important is the ending. It should kind of tie everything together, kind of go back to the beginning and leave the reader with what you overall want their feeling to be or what you want them to take away from. All right, some examples. Oh, yes, you have to do it in 600 words or less. So I, you know, a lot of faculty, they're just clearing their throats at 650 words. Um, it's, it's hard to do. Um, I routinely get stuff sent to me that's 2,000 words. Um, sometimes if I have the time, I'll go through and edit it. Half the time, I just ask them to cut it down. But you know, yes, you do see op-eds running 800 to 1,000. But more than likely, they all started at 650, 700 words. And then at editor discretion, they went back and asked the author for more on this specific area or this specific area. All op-eds that we send out from UT are around 650 words or less. Um, don't drop below 550 words though. There is, a, there is a range there. So if like 550 to 700 is a good range. Okay, so this is an op-ed that was sent to me um, about, this happened in 2015, and this is when the Pope 
was uh, coming to America for the first time. And this is how, this is the first two paragraphs on how it was sent to me. Um, and it really isn't all that bad. You can see the color code down there on what it, on what it is, the, what makes it topical next week, okay? Um, which actually it's not, you don't want to timestamp it anyway, right? You don't want to say tomorrow, yesterday, next week, because you don't know when it's going to, when it's going to actually publish. So you want to use words like recently or coming up, you know, the, where it could be any timestamp. And then it was good. You know, he actually put a little bit of opinion in the first paragraph, which was really, really good for this, for this author. So this is how we switched it around in the first three paragraphs, right? So, uh, you know, I'll let you read it there is that we may, what makes it topical will soon arrive. It's not next week, right? Then we move into his opinion, right? And then the call to action in the third paragraph where it's, um, you know, or, you know, the, how we're going to move forward, what we're going to do. Okay. This, when it, you can color code like this, this is where it's a really good op-ed, right? And then this one, this is where he put his research into it. Um, you know, you can't be self-promotional and you can't be, you know, uh, UT-centric. So I get asked, well, how do you put research in? You know, I did the study. Well, you can just say, I, you know, I, I didn't do the study, but my study backs up what my overall point is. So it's not about his study. He's using his study to art, make an argument. And this time it was about school shootings and teacher burnout. And then finally, oh, one more, one more thread. One thing that we do as well and that you can do is that we make um, city specific op-eds. So this is a school discipline, you know, race and school op-ed. And we, uh, we had standalone paragraph or standalone paragraphs on each of these color codes um, that, as you can see, are city specific, which is the editors like, it's more work for us, but the editors like it is because it localizes it for their market, which is something that they really like. And then finally, uh, this is just an example of any topic can be an op-ed. We wrote it, it was uh, Shakespeare's 450th birthday and we have a, a Shakespeare researcher and I got him to write an op-ed, but look at it, it's how to move forward. It's not, he didn't describe Shakespeare, what Shakespeare has been for the last, it's, is Shakespeare still relevant today and is he gonna be relevant tomorrow? Okay, good. I think that's it. Stop sharing. That is so helpful. <laughs> We're definitely gonna have to steal those uh, from you and, and take another look at those for sure. Um, yeah, we can, if we want, we can go ahead and do some Q and A right now um, since you ended with questions. And so if you have any questions, you can send them in the chat. I know that we had, we had a question that came that was, that can go to either Juan or Matt. That is how long have opinion pages been around and how are they resourced compared to other sections of a paper? I, I don't specifically know how long at when they started, but I, I think it's been well over a hundred years. Um, what was the second part? How are they resourced? How are they resourced? Um, this, I guess that refers to staffing and that sort of thing. Um, you know, we're, yeah. I think everyone knows about the downsizing of newspapers in general, and that has hit uh, our, our section, our department, um, just like everyone else in, in the business. So we have fewer resources than we did uh, maybe 10 years ago, and uh, certainly fewer than we did 20 years ago. Um, so that does inhibit our ability to, to do some things, like for example, to work uh, as much as we would like with a, a given uh, submission. Um, Matt mentioned, you know, that we're not gonna have time to edit you know, generally the, the, the guest op-eds that he turns in or that, that the UT professors uh, submit don't need much work, but they do need some occasionally. And so uh, we'll general, generally edit those um, not too hard. Uh, sometimes we'll cut them for space. Uh, they might be a little longer than what we usually use. But uh, I will say this, every, every submission, and like I said earlier, sometimes we have um, 50 or more, 
during the legislative session, we, we might have a hundred uh, op-ed submissions a week. And when the pandemic first started, we were getting a hundred submissions a week. Um, so that, you know, we don't have as much time to uh, work with everything, but we do edit everything. Uh, we just had a piece uh, submitted on Proposition A on the November 3rd ballot. This is the uh, big uh, Capital Metro light rail, uh, you know, um, bond proposition. Um, we worked on that one for weeks, probably through six rounds of editing, probably. And ultimately, we felt that it did not answer some questions that needed to be addressed. So we turned it down. Um, people should know that if you submit an op-ed, you have to expect that it will be edited. And that includes for a whole list of things from word count to grammar, to accuracy, to fairness, to balance, uh, and, and a dozen other factors, uh, just like we would edit one of our own writers. That's great. Thank you so much for your advice. And we got a few questions coming in. Um, and the first one is actually to the point that you just spoke on, which is when you write on the latest news, how can you make sure your opinion is based on legitimate sources? And that can be for either of y'all. You know, like what we do is, you know, when we do topical references or when the professor, you know, cites something, it, it's not from a, a, a we have we hyperlink out to wherever it is that he to back up his stuff and it has to be to a mainstream news source you know cnn abc um fox you know something like that not something that is super left or super right um you know because that that takes off you know just their own you know it, then you then it start then you gets more questions than answers type of a thing so um you know stay with the mainstream news um and op-ed editors will usually take that if you back use it to back up something you know and hyperlink in there too mm, yes hyperlinks um that's something that we've talked about quite a bit at veins report our next question is can you offer any advice for pitching op-eds especially for students who don't have the level of professional experience and expertise yeah you know i would just say you know, one, you can t say it from the other side, but, you know, keep it short with your pitch. So, you know, when you write your op-ed, um, paste it in the body of your email. Do not send an attachment because uh, sometimes, you know, the news, the news uh, walls will stop it. Um, you know, put your title, not your title of your op-ed, but just maybe a few key words on maybe what makes it topical in your title and your um, in the email. Um, uh, whatever the title of the subject. Email. Yeah. And then, um, and then, you know, uh, just a few sentences, um, you know, dear editor, you know, an op-ed is pasted below about X, Y, and Z, you know, because X, Y, and Z is happening now. And I argue that this, 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 and this, the piece is 680 words. Please let me know if you have interest. You know, it doesn't need to be a whole paragraph. You know, these editors are moving quick. So they're, they're just going to mm -hmm. scan it. They're going to scan the title of your email and scan a few sentences on what's it about and see if it fits into their their rundown mm -hmm. so, on did i you know please what i don't know if there's what else is there to add for uh, you know, everything you said is good um you know if you can distinguish your pitch from others by sort of citing uh whatever relevant experience you might have on that topic that that really helps a lot um there are different thoughts, schools of thought on, on the, the topic of, of experience or expertise rather. Um, some people think that you don't have to be an expert in a, in a given topic, uh, on a given topic. Um, but generally my experience has been that it really helps if you know what you're talking about. Um, so chances are in, that your pitch will get a little more notice if, if say you, you, you've studied this or you worked in this field or, uh, 
or you just have a life experience that um, lends itself to whatever you're writing about. Um, but everything that Matt said, especially keeping the pitch short and to the point really, really is helpful. Thank you. I was always told never to email an editor and ask them if you can send them an op-ed because they just won't reply. <laughs> They're too busy to respond to that. Just send it to them. Um, or, mm -hmm. Yeah, just send it to them. And don't take yeah. side, you know, if, and if they don't respond, then just move on. Yeah. So don't bug them. We have two more questions. Um, the next one is, how can an op-ed break through the constant election coverage these weeks? Is there room for non-political topics? I think there's lots of room. In fact, uh, whenever a, a certain topic is dominating the news, I think one of the things that people like me look for is something that is off the topic to, you know, to sort of um, give people something else to think about. Um, it, it sort of adds to the mix and we generally look for something like that. Um, you know, we like to uh, every now and then run sort of something non-traditional uh, with, you know, something like an essay, for example. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, Oh, we had an essay back when the pandemic began. Uh, a gentleman, and I think he worked. I think he works at UT, um, but he sent this one on his own, and it was about he and his family went on a very rare trip. They they went outside of their comfort zone during the pandemic, and they went to uh, Enchanted Rock, and uh, it was about the experience and stepping out of the comfort zone, being a little afraid, but wanting to ex explore life just the same. The people they saw along the way, uh, how they interacted as humans, it was just really well done and gave people a lot to think about. And I think it was, uh, you know, sort of off the beaten path as far as what we usually would run, but that was the kind of piece, and it was well written. Um, that counts for a lot too. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> but yeah, that's great to know. Um, sometimes it's getting very difficult to constantly be reading the same things in the news. Mm -hmm. And our last question, how specific should the call to action be beyond just X, Y, Z should be done? Does it need to include a step-by-step -step plan for implementation? implementation? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yes and no. It depend. Don't get too far down the rabbit hole on, on it. I mean, um, you know, the general guidelines of the vision and the opinion, I think, as the question said, it is probably good. You know, it just needs to be, you know, you know, it depends on how specific the plan is. You know, if you get too far into it, you know, they're not, summaries are just going to, you know, get that glazed overlook. So, you know, it's it's finding that right balance, but it does need to have, you know, enough of a specific call to action to where, um, you know, there's action steps on what to do. You know, one, I don't, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think somewhere in between that there should be specific steps outlined, but you don't want to get into too much detail. Um, we know we've talked about this, generally speaking, but you, you have to remember that the audience, who your audience is, and in this case, we're talking about ordinary people, uh, newspaper subscribers, who may or may not have the expertise that you might have on a specific topic. Um, so you want to convey to that ordinary reader what you know, and but do it in a way that's understandable to a lay person, um, especially somebody who might not have that background, the same background. Yeah, and to that point, that's why how you write it is important. You know, short sentences, 10 to 12 words, you know, not 20 to 30 word sentences. You know, paragraphs, not, you know, 650 words should not be broken into three paragraphs. You know, there should be, you know, seven, eight paragraphs, short little things to where it's just nice and easy to flow. So I think flow is extremely important in offense. 
And thankfully, I this, oh. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to add that um, the op-eds that, that Matt sends in are, you know, they always have the call to action, which is great. But one of the things that we see from, from um, other sources, uh, regular folks who, who submit op-eds, is they don't include a call to action at all. Um, and that's a problem. We, you know, we'll reach out to them and say, hey, this op-ed is great. You make a, gr a credible point here. Your thesis is great. Your argument is good. Uh, but so what do you advocate? How you cite a problem here? And, and so what is, what are your thoughts on, you know, how do we get around this? What's the best avenue to uh, address this issue or whatever? And uh, an example that comes to mind is that that op-ed on Proposition A, uh, as submitted, it was about, oh, 900 words on how bad uh, Prop A is because it would cost taxpayers all this much money. Um, it wasn't well thought out. I mean, on and on and on about how bad it was, but it didn't address at all all right, if you don't pass it, then you want the status quo to remain. And the status quo is that we are the 11th largest city in the country with a hell of a traffic problem. And you can't ignore that. You've got to address that. In fact, I think one of the best uh, marks of a really strong op-ed is to anticipate your opponents or the other side's best argument and, and flat out come out and address it and say, you know, we realize that uh, the other side thinks this and that and that. Address it and deal with it. That helps a lot. Yeah, and, and to, you know, to the call to action, you know, don't, don't overthink it. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, we just put out an op-ed yesterday that, that's actually, I think, in the Statesman today um, that was about social work and the state licensing board changing their code of ethics to where they can discriminate now. Social workers are free to discriminate against uh, those with disabilities and the LGBTQ. Uh, and, you know. and so the op-ed is about arguing that that actually goes against you know, the very profession on what you know, their code of ethics. I mean, that's just, you know, no call to action is there. They need to switch it back. So, I mean, it's, it's not too groundbreaking, but the whole op-ed is, is arguing the point that this goes against you know, the very profession of social works to be social workers to be able to discriminate against, you know, groups that they don't like. Um, but the call to action in there is simply, you know, Greg Abbott needs to tell the licensing board to go back to the way it was. It's not very groundbreaking and it's pretty self-explanatory, but, you know, there, there it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm super excited to see Everyone that is in here right now is eligible to submit an article for a contest that we have coming up. So I'm excited to see what y'all's call to actions are. So thank you so much to Matt and Juan. I'm gonna speak real quickly just to what our contest in is. So if you need to jump out, you can, but um, more than welcome to stay and hear what we're doing. So we have a contest coming up and it will be due on November 6th by midnight which is just after the election in case you want to include any last bit tidbits and if hopefully we know who wins at that point. Um, yeah, if we, want, <laughs> if we want to include any last bit thoughts on that, it's a topic of your choice. It must be an op-ed. We will upload um, all of these instructions as well as some of Matt's great uh, tips and tricks to our website, which you can find, I'll share right now into the chat. Um, our social medias are in our email and like we talked about it should be short so we're going to say no more than 625 words because that's what Juan says the statesman usually goes by and Juan will consider the winning article for publication if it is up to his fantastic standards and a lot of the um, better articles will also be considered for publication at the Baines Report so you have two chances to be published and if y'all have any other questions, I'm sending our social medias right now and our email into the chats and you can find our webpage real easily. It's just fainsreport.com. Um, let us know, send us an email, send us a Facebook, anything y'all need, but I'm super excited to see the articles 
And if y'all need any help getting started or even uh, just brainstorming, hit us up. And I know Matt is going to be available with some of the top articles to help get them ready for Juan's judgment. But that's all we have for today. So follow us on, on the gram or uh, send us an email if you need anything. But thank y'all so much for coming. And thank you so much to Matt and Juan for joining us today. It was awesome having y'all and super helpful. Sure. Glad we could be here. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.